So I've really been enjoying going through the books of the first and second kings. There's a lot of cool stories in here. There's a lot of action, excitement, you know, different kings and wars and stuff going on. But honestly, I think we're getting into the section now as of like my favorite parts of these books. I like the early parts with Solomon and, you know, um, David's kind of in 2 Samuel more, but like um, the early reign was, was really neat. But now at the end here, because you remember last week, we read all about the northern kingdom of Israel being taken captive. They, lo you know, they, they, they lost to the Assyrians. Assyrians took them captive. And now in this chapter, we're going to see, you know, a little bit, it kind of recovers that, that story because um, that was uh, dealing with the story from the perspective of the kings of Israel. Now we're going to Hezekiah. Hezekiah is the king of Judah, and, and he's king um, right or, you know, at the same time that that was going on. So we're going to see King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah, if there was ever a hero in the Bible, I mean, he's, he is a great hero to have, uh, a lot of faith. We're going to see right off the bat Hezekiah and just a lot of the cool things that he's done. And we're going to also be, you know, if you want to keep right now, if you want to get a, a reference in, um, you know, get a reference in Numbers 21 because we're going to go there first. But we're also going to be going to 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles, we're going to be, you know, obviously like we've done in the past, going through a lot of the parallel stories, getting extra information in here about Hezekiah and some of the things that he's done. So, um, and just like everybody, you know, Hezekiah wasn't perfect. Every hero in the Bible has done things wrong. They're sinners. They've made mistakes. But, I mean, you could definitely tell the difference between the heroes and the villains, right? The heroes and, and those that maybe even didn't do quite that much for the Lord. Hezekiah is one of these kings. And is it, I mean, it, I'm excited to preach this. And I'll try not to keep you guys here too late, but there's just so much that can be said in these chapters, especially the ones that are just, they get more and more exciting. There's a lot of things going on. Let's get started here in verse number one. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abbi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Look at verse 4. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. Now, Right off the bat, we see Hezekiah as a different type of king, a different type of guy, someone who's already sold out to serve the Lord. And notice it, it relates, he did good like David, according to all that David his father did. That's not referenced that much when you see the righteous kings. You know, most of them are, they did that which was right, but not like David their father, right? Like, like they did good, but it wasn't that good. Hezekiah is someone who, his heart was with the Lord. His heart was right with God. You know, David made a lot of mistakes. Hezekiah made some mistakes, but their, his heart was right. I mean, we read chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter saying, but the high places weren't taken down, but they still had the groves, but they still had these altars, right? They still had all of this idolatry and the stuff that was just there. Hezekiah comes in and he says, we're getting rid of it all. We're tearing down those high places. We're stamping it into powder. We're getting rid of it and being done with it. This is one of the reasons why I like Hezekiah so much, just because he did a lot of things. He uh, kept the Passover. We're going to get into that. That hadn't been kept for a while. And he's coming off the heels of someone who wasn't a good king in Judah. So Hezekiah is kind of getting things right. We had a lot, he has a lot of good preaching going on during this time in Isaiah. We're not going to get to that today, but Isaiah basically has... Um, the same story being told of Rapshaki coming and, you know, telling them that, you know, that they're going to come and, and the king of Assyria is going to come and destroy them and all this stuff um, that we see later in this chapter. It's, all, it's like identical story in Isaiah. And you have all this great preaching of Isaiah. And I think it's really hit home with Hezekiah. And not just Isaiah. I mean, there's other prophets. We've, I went through that in a previous sermon where we just kind of went through all these different guys that are preaching during this time. And I think it, it really has, has hit home with Isaiah. Now, one of the things I also want to, is, is that is pointed out here that wasn't mentioned before this at all in verse 4 there, was it says he break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. So we hear about this brazen serpent in, in Numbers chapter 21. And um, 
This was when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. And apparently this, bra this brazen serpent wasn't a bad thing when it was made. It was a good thing. It was actually something that God had Moses make. Now, we know that the Ten Commandments say not to make any graven images and not to make any idols, but if God says to make something, it's not a, gra a graven image. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not against the law of God. He's not, you know, it's not even a contradiction if he's telling them to make some things. I mean, you could say the same thing about the, um, you know, the temple and, and the things that were in there and the cherubim, right? I mean, the Bible says not to make images of anything, any likeness of the things in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, right? So... But yeah, the Ark of the Covenant, but th these things were commanded by God as, as being something that they were supposed to do, obviously not breaking any of the commandments. So what God did, he had Moses make this brazen serpent. It was a good thing. And what happened was the children of Israel were being plagued because of their own uh, problems, because of their own sin. They were murmuring and complaining and stuff like that. And then God sent these serpents to plague them. So they were being bit by snakes. And in order to be healed, what they had to do was look to this brazen serpent that Moses had on a rod, and then they would automatically be healed. So it was like this miraculous thing, right? And we're going to read a little bit about it in Numbers 21, just because what, what had happened, though, is that they had turned that into an idol. So what started off as fine, as even good, as not sin, the children of Israel, after time, they just they turned this thing into an idol and were bowing down and worshiping this snake that it was not intended for at all. So as a result of that, Hezekiah is just like, well, we're, we're breaking that down too. Because at that point, they didn't even really need it for what its intended purpose was anyways, right? So there's no reason for them to, you know, there's no problem with them destroying it. He's just saying, oh, you guys are going to make this an idol? We're done with it. We're getting rid of all the idolatry. Uh, you're in Numbers 21 now, hopefully. Look at you would at verse number 5 in Numbers 21. The Bible says, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light bread. That light bread is the manna, right? The, the miraculous food that God provided that they didn't have to work for. They didn't have to do anything. All they had to do was go out and scoop it up, go out and collect it and eat it. They're totally being provided for. But after a while, they get this bad attitude, this rotten attitude of, oh, this, we don't like this light bread. We, no, not only do we not like it, they say we loathe it. Loathe means hate. They abhor this light bread. Oh, I can't. if I have to eat this for another day, I'm going to die. That type of an attitude. And you know, we need to watch out for this type of an attitude because this is the spoiled, rotten attitude that so many people are so easy to just fall into. Oh, I can't believe we have to eat this. Oh, I can't believe we have to have rice or beans or potatoes or whatever the case may be. I deal with this all the time because I have so many young children that, you know, they, they, they have a tendency to get picky about their food. And the only reason why they're even able to get picky is because we live in a, in a rich society. We have a lot of, of means, even those, even those without a lot of money, overall in this country are living very, very, very well and have options and we have grocery stores and, you know, things are just not that expensive overall when it comes to the variety of food that we have coming from all over the place and foods that are, that are not in season that we could eat year round. I mean, there's so much that we have, yet we have a tendency just to complain and murmur instead of being happy with what God has given us. And look, I don't care how much money you have. If you have a lot or a little, you be content with what you have. You don't complain, oh, I can't believe we're having this again. Oh, I don't like that. I don't want to eat that. You know what God did? Look, look at what God did in Numbers 21. And look, think about this. Their situation is way worse con compared to yours as far as what they have versus what you have. They had one thing to eat for their meals every single day. That's it. They never had a change of, oh, well, I could eat this or this or this. They were provided with manna, and they drank water. Water and bread is what they survived on for 40 years. 
Keep that in mind. And, and look at God's attitude towards them. You could say, wow, well, if I had to eat the same just bread and water every day for 40 years, I might be a little, you know, have a bad attitude too. Look at how angry that makes God and now compare that to everything else that you have in your life where you're not just living on bread and water every day of your life. Look at verse number six, because that's what they're doing in verse five. They were complaining, oh, our soul hates it. We loathe this light bread. Verse six, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. God sent snakes in to bite them and kill them because that's how much it made God angry to hear the murmuring and complaining. And you know what? We ought to have a, a very serious mindset. You, you know, parent, husbands and, and, and dads, they don't like to hear complaining either because the husband is the one who's providing for the family. Just as God provided for the children of Israel. When God's providing for his children and his family, he hated the complaining so much that he sent in, you know, fire, fiery serpents to destroy them. Now, obviously, like me as a father, I'm not going to send fiery serpents to destroy my children, but the, the attitude is still there. And we need to realize this, you know, when it comes to the house, children, wives, whoever, anyone in the house needs to recognize you know, you ought not to be complaining about what your husband is providing for you, what your, what your father is providing for you. You ought to just be happy with it and be content with it because that's the way that God wants you to be. And husbands and fathers, we need to be content with what God has given us, with the ability that we have, with, with this, wherever situation we're in, whether we have a lot or a little bit of money, it doesn't matter. We need to be content too and not be just upset. Oh man, I can't believe I have to have this or that. God takes this seriously. God hates complaining and murmuring because that shows that you are not content. That shows that you are dissatisfied with what God has done for you. And that is a wicked attitude to have. And that's what he's getting across here to these people. I mean, even just having bread and water every day for 40 years, it's a wicked attitude to not be thankful for that. We need to have humble hearts and spirits before God. So he sent these fiery serpents as a judgment because of their murmuring, because of their complaining. Look at verse number seven. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. So they repented. They got right. They realized, oh man, we got God angry. You know, we're wrong. They acknowledged their sin. They're repentant. And now he, they go to Moses. So then the Lord... Um, Moses goes to God. Verse 8 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. He says, God commanding Moses to do this. Moses didn't come up with this on his own. He didn't make an idol. God said, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a certain serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, it's a really cool story. It's great. But obviously, this is demonstrating a bigger picture. And in John chapter 3, we get a little bit more insight as to what this all means because it's more than just they got bit by serpents and then they're healed by looking at the serpent. God's teaching more. There's, a, there's symbolism there. And in John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in verse 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. This event of the fiery serpent, the brazen serpent being put on a stick before the children of Israel is a picture of salvation. It was a picture of Jesus Christ being put on the cross and whoever looks to Jesus is healed of their sins and their transgressions and they receive that cleansing. The same way that the children of Israel, when they got poisoned, when they were corrupted by the, the, the deathly bite of a serpent, when they looked to that brazen serpent, 
they were healed just just like that no you know no medical intervention they were miraculously healed just by looking at that the same in the same way you know as the same way that that serpent was put on that stick Jesus Christ needed to be lifted up because what he did what Moses did he would lift up that serpent on the staff right in front of the people for them to look on Jesus Christ of course was lifted up from the earth on the cross and we need to look to him to be saved. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, wait a minute, that's kind of a, in a weird image of why, how, why would a serpent represent Jesus Christ, right? And that's a legitimate question to ask. You say, because normally serpents are, are um, associated with Satan in the Bible, right? The devil is, is, is commonly referred to as being a serpent. And obviously, we're not saying that Jesus is a devil. But think about this. It's not, it's not that weird at all when you consider the Bible says that Jesus Christ was made sin for us, right? That, that when he was on the tree, he bare the sins of the whole world in his own body. So he was embodying that sin and became sin. And what better image to represent, you know, extreme sinfulness, all the sins of the whole world as a serpent, right? I mean, a serpent always represents evil and, you know, bad things like that. So it, it symbolizes him becoming sin for us and taking that punishment for us, right? So that's, it's not saying that Jesus is a serpent. It's saying that he, be, you know, I mean, in a way became that for us because he became sin and he embodied sin for us in order to pay for our sins. That's why it's being used as a symbol to symbolize our Savior being nailed to the cross. Um, now, what I like about Hezekiah is that not only did he remove the high places and, and break the images down and stuff like that that um, I think would be pretty obvious to anyone reading Scripture and being true to God's Word that those needed to go, right? That that was uh, uh, something that had to be done, cutting down the groves, because these are specifically mentioned in Scripture, not to have the high places, not to have the groves, right? Even in Moses' law, that, that they weren't supposed to be doing that. But what I really like about Hezekiah is that he went all the way and even got rid of that brazen serpent when that was being used as an idol. Because that's something where someone, he could have left that and said, well, Moses made that, right? This is, this is a piece, well, think about this. It's a piece of, uh, of history. What's the big thing we got going on today? You know, people are all up in arms and upset about these statues to Robert E. Lee and, you know, these graven images of all these other people, all the radio. And the whole raising thing is a whole another story with stupidity anyways. But I say, let's not stop with those graven images. Let's get rid of all of them. I don't know why any Christian cares about an idol or a graven image being taken down out of this land. Let's remove all of them. Hey, let's get rid of the high places. Let's get rid of all these stinking, brazen, carved images of man and of beasts and of things up in heaven and things under the earth. Let's get rid of all those idolatry. Get rid of it all. Let's not stop with just one or two. Get rid of all of them for all I care. But what we see here is that Hezekiah wasn't afraid to make people upset because I'm sure a lot of people are upset, especially with the destroying of that serpent. This is an important artifact in our religion. Think about this. I mean, hundreds of years ago. Think about something being remaining from hundreds of years ago today, from the 1600s, from the 1500s or whatever, right? Something that's really old. This artifact that was so important in our faith. He destroyed it. And he did the right thing, by the way. He didn't, he didn't care as much about the tradition. He didn't care as much about what people thought about it. What he cared about is that people were bowing down and worshiping and made an idol of it. He said, you know what? Idolatry is going to be gone from the land. Yeah, it was good while it lasted. It served its purpose. But let's get rid of it now. We're done with it. And he got rid of that serpent. You know, I actually get a little bit concerned with modern day Christianity making idols out of things that are not inherently bad, just as that brazen serpent wasn't inherently a bad thing. And what I see happening is people getting a little bit too idolatrous, if you will, with the cross. And you know what? That's going to offend a lot of people. I don't think it's going to offend anyone in this room tonight. 
But I, I had someone come and visit the church once and just ask us, you know, one thing that just I don't understand about you at all, and he just came and visited like one time was, he, and I don't remember his exact words, I'm, I'm definitely paraphrasing, but he was saying, he made a comment about us not having a cross at all. And I was like, yeah, we're not going to have a cross. And it's not because I have any contempt for Jesus dying on the cross. I don't, you know, like, obviously I'm extremely glad that our Savior paid a price for my soul. But my concern is that it becomes too much of an idol. I mean, there's literally even songs, you know, like, of, of like just kneeling down to the cross and people just bowing down. And I don't even want to give off the impression of evil. You know what I mean? And you know, what I'm more excited about, even more than the cross, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm more excited about the empty tomb. I'm more excited about that than a dying Jesus. You know, the Catholic Church is the one that has the crucifix, which is like basically the dead Jesus hung up all around their, their, you know, their places of worship, their churches. And that, that's the big idol for them. And they'll bow down to those crucifix and they'll carry them around their neck and use them as a good luck charm, which is really just an idol. Seriously. I mean, that's what it is. It's idolatry. Amen. Thinking that you're getting some special powers or something coming from this object. It's idolatry. And I don't want to have anything to do with it. And that's why we'll never have these big images of crosses and, you know, or, or like literal crosses outside of the church. Now, Inherently, there's nothing wrong with a cross. It's not even an image of, you know, an animal or a person or anything like that, at least the ones that don't have Jesus hanging on it, right? Just, just a regular old cross. But I think it's getting to a point like this brazen serpent gotten to where people are just really getting way too into it and looking to that more than just they should, you know, more than its proper role in the history. So... We need to be worried about, and, and you know, the things with like the, the fish and the cars and the doves and all these symbols that try to symbolize your Christianity. Well, wait a minute. Let's, let's just worry about God's explicit laws first. When he says not to make any images or any likeness of any fowl in the heaven or any fish in the sea. And those are like the two images that people want to use to represent Christianity. The fish and the, and the dove, Right? And, you know, if you don't think they're idols, that's, you know, I don't care. But I, I would just say, why even get that close to, you know, like, I, I'm just, have a little bit more fear of the Lord and just say, we don't need this stuff. You know, we don't need to, to show our faith by putting an image of a beast or a four-footed thing or a creeping thing on our car. That's not how we need to show our faith. Why don't you show your faith instead of by putting an image on your vehicle? Why don't you show your faith by giving the gospel to somebody? That's going to be way more effective anyways than putting some stupid fish on your car. When's the last time someone got saved from looking at a fish on the back of a, of a vehicle? Or anything's even happened as a result of that. It's just to make you feel better, like you're showing your faith somehow. And you're getting a false sense of, of actually doing work for the Lord. I'm against that stuff. Let's go back here now to 2 Kings 18. I, just, I wanted to bring it up because it, it makes the point that like, it had gotten out of control with, the, with that serpent. But that Hezekiah was man enough, and, and not just man enough, but loved God enough, more importantly, to just say, we're done with it all. We're cleaning house. We're getting right with God. Praise God. That's one of the reasons I love Hezekiah. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that, and this is a great statement. Think about this as a testimony. These next words we're going to read, imagine if this could be said about your life. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. He was unique. No king after him nor before him was like Hezekiah in the way that he served the Lord, which is also very, very important because Josiah is another great king that we're going to get to in a few weeks who is one of my absolute favorite characters in the whole Bible. He got the sodomites out of the land, which is a big thing, you know, scored a lot of points in my book. 
<laughs> for doing that, among other things. You know, he, he was an, another very similar character of just getting things right with God in the land. But this is, this is a great testimony, a great story in God's word for God to be describing Hezekiah in such a way. Very unique person. Let's look at verse number six. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. He had respect to God's laws. He kept the commandments. I mean, obviously he wasn't perfect, but you know, he was, he was uh, definitely doing his best to live a righteous life. Verse number seven, and the Lord was with him and he prospered whithersoever he went forth and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. God was with him and God promises that too. You know, when you're going to be doing right by God, God will be with you. When you're in the will of the Lord, God is with you. And you don't have any reason to fear. And he had boldness and he was going to say, he said, you know what? I'm not going to serve you, king of Assyria. And the Assyrians were way more powerful and mighty than Judah was. Way more powerful. They, they, they're the ones that, that took Israel captive. And remember before, Israel was stronger than Judah from earlier battles. Ver, at, this, at this time in their history, I mean, that was, that's, that's where they're at. Verse number eight. He smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, they took it, even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. So this is going pretty much in chronological order. We read about the, you know, Samaria being taken in the previous chapter. But at this point, so everything that we read about Hezekiah, you know, not uh, bowing down to the king of Assyria and everything else, that happened, that, that was happening prior to the Assyrians actually taking Samaria, right? Because we just read about that before this event. So he was, he was standing up to them. He was beating the Philistines. And then it says in verse 11, And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river of Gozan and in the cities of the Medes, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. And all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them nor do them. And again, I covered this last week, but it's again just, just demonstrating that God's judgment came upon Israel and that's why Assyria defeated him because they did not want to hear the word of the Lord. They want to have nothing to do with it. They rejected God. God rejected them and brought judgment upon them. Verse 13, Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria. So now this is a different king. You notice it was Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, that came and, and took Samaria. But now, you know, years later, the 14th year of Hezekiah, which has been eight years since Samaria was taken, basically. Now Sennacherib, king of Assyria, comes up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. So to this point, 14 years, Hezekiah has been not bowing down to Assyria. And he's been resisting them. Even after they took Israel, even after they took Samaria and, and took them captive and defeated them, he still wasn't bowing down. But now it's the 14th year and Assyria comes up against them and they actually take the fenced cities around, you know, so like the smaller cities, not Jerusalem, but like some of the smaller fenced cities, cities that had a little bit of, of fortification, they came and, and were able to take those cities. Um, in verse 14, it says, And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended Return from me, that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So he finally just says, okay, fine, you got me. You know, like, I'm sorry, I offended, and now I'll, I'll pay you tribute. So he's giving in, he's backing down, right? He's no longer being um, resisting the Assyrians. Now, this is not something that Hezekiah should have done because we're going to see in the next few verses what he does in order to pay off the king of Assyria. He takes the, the gold and silver out of the, the house of the Lord, basically, in order to pay that. And other kings have done that in the past. They get scared. They get worried. But I mean, think about it. He's been, he's been dealing with this for 14 years. 
you know, it's been wearing on them. Israel was taken captive. Assyria is continuing to grow in their power. And he had a weak, he's having a weak point. Now, this doesn't define him. We're going to see, because this chapter doesn't end with the result of, of them basically threatening Hezekiah, but he remains strong, and we'll see that next week. But um, after all these years of resistance and stuff, he ends up just giving in and trying to pay off the Assyrians, leave him alone. But we see really quickly that this doesn't even work because he gives them the money, right? But then they still don't leave him alone because then they're still coming back and, and saying, no, we're going to take you captive. And, you know, like this is just going to be the way it is. And that's the way it is with bullies. That's why you don't just give in to people who are just threatening you and scaring you and trying, you know, and just, just trying to extort you and everything else because if, when you give in, it's never going to stop. It's never going to be enough. Their wickedness is never going to be satisfied. And we see that happening on all fronts, not just monetarily, but, you know, when it comes to uh, moral things, when it comes to things that are morally right or wrong, you know, the, the wicked people of this world are never satisfied, just like hell is never satisfied. They don't, you know, when they get the, the Christians and the conservatives backing up on marriage, backing off on homosexuality, backing off on adultery and fornication and any type of wickedness, it's never enough. They're going to keep on pushing and pushing. So don't ever give up an inch to these people at all. It's not worth it. I don't care how tired you become, how weary you get of fighting, never give in and never give up because if you're in the will of God, God won't leave you or forsake you. God will be walking with you. And Hezekiah should have had a little bit more faith to trust in God to say, nope, God is with me. I don't need to pay these guys off with the treasure of the house of the Lord. That's what he should have done. Now, Again, Hezekiah was a great man of God, but he, they all have their faults. Everybody has, just as we do. None of us are perfect. We've all made grievous mistakes in our own lives as well. But the lesson we learn from this and from Hezekiah's mistake is don't give up to this. And it happens in every aspect of life. Let's keep reading here, verse 15. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. So he doesn't just, just use, you know, the stuff in the house of the Lord. He also, his own, you know, the king's wealth and stuff. He's just paying off whatever he can. And it says in verse 16, At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Now, this is just a shame because, you know, Hezekiah was getting things right with God. And one of those things that he did was over, overlaid the pillars with gold again because they had already been stripped previously from other kings. And he's like, no, we're getting back to serving God, trying to build this thing back up again and, and, and get back to, to serving God. And then he, he did that and he took that back down again in order to pay off the Assyrians. So if you didn't catch that, because it says he took it from the pillars, which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid. He was the one that overlaid it. He's the one that took it back down to pay off the king of Assyria. Verse 17, and the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshaki from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asap, the, the recorder. And Rabshaki said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? So basically what happens is that the king of Assyria sends Rabshake and his servants, you know, to go and threaten Judah and Hezekiah. So Hezekiah sends his ambassadors out. He stays behind. And, and this is the message that they're giving him. They're saying, you know, because they're resisting again. So he's saying, well, what confidence are you trusting in? What, what is it that makes you think that you can resist us? Verse 20. Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? And look at just the pride and arrogancy going forth from these guys. Verse 21. Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. But if ye say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he 
whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah had taken away, and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, You shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now, we have a little bit of the information from the beginning of this chapter, but turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 29 of, of Hezekiah getting rid of the high places, right, and, and, and really cleaning things up and getting the idolatry out of the land. We're going to see a little bit more about what he did in 2 Chronicles 29, but um, if you understand what Rabshakeh is saying, what the king of Assyria is saying, he's saying, you know, wait a minute, you know, if you're trusting in Egypt, you know, they're a bruised reed. They're not going to give you strength. Don't be relying on Egypt to help you out because we're way stronger and tougher and we're still going to defeat you. You know, don't think that you're going to get help from Egypt to save you. And then he's saying, well, and if you're trusting in the Lord, right, they're God. If you're trusting in the Lord, I wouldn't do that either because he's saying, you, you want to trust in the Lord? And, and what, from their perspective, they're saying, isn't that he whose high places and altars Hezekiah took away? So their understanding of worshiping the Lord is just all backwards. They have no clue what they're supposed to be doing. All they're familiar with is what the people had been doing, which was completely wrong, right? Worshiping in the high places. Of, and they look at this and saying, well, he took away all these places of worship. Why do you think the Lord's going to protect you now that you took away all of these high places? And you know what I mean? Like they're thinking that the Lord will be mad at Hezekiah for doing those things because he's taken away all these places of worship as opposed to, no, he was actually doing the right thing. They just don't get it all because they're blind because they're not saved. They don't understand the Lord at all. They just think he's like these other false gods of the land that they had already defeated. And they, they have no respect for the Lord they don't think that he's a god at all. They just, they just are going to keep on with their war machine. So that's what they're saying to him. Like, isn't this the same Hezekiah that, that just took down everything? So don't trust in the Lord for that. Look at 2 Chronicles 29, verse 3. We're going to see a little bit more of the exploits of Hezekiah and, and the things that he did. Uh, verse 3 says, he, he in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So right away, his, his first piece of business, you know how you, we hear the president, you know, if I'm elected president, what I'm going to do on day one, I'm going to repeal, repeal Obamacare, right? I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. They're like, yeah, right. They're always empty promises. Well, what did Hezekiah do? He wasn't worried about his foreign policy. He wasn't worried about the economy. He wasn't worried about jobs. He was worried about getting right with God. On day one of his reign, what did he do? The first year of his reign, the first month, he opened up the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place because it had been corrupted with idols and things like that from the previous king. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs and they have shut up the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the Lord God of Israel. Wherefore, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, as ye see with your eyes. He's saying all these problems that we're having these days is because we're not right with God. He said, we're getting right with God. We're going to, you know, People have been so blind and don't understand why all these bad things are happening to us. He says, I know why it's not happening because I read the word of the Lord and this is what we're supposed to be doing and no one's been doing it. Our fathers failed us. And instead of following the tradition of his fathers that were wicked, he says, no, we're going to reset things and get right with God. So he explains, this is what you're seeing is happening. Verse number nine, for lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. He also ended up decreeing, turn if you would to chapter 30, to hold the Passover, which had not been done in a really long time, and he sent to Israel after that they had been taken captive. See, Hezekiah had a view of not just Judah, but of all Israel kind of being one. He still considered, you know, the northern kingdom, his brethren, and you can see he's reaching out and he's, he wants to get this unity back again, even though they've already been destroyed, they've had a lot of wicked kings, he's hoping that 
hey, why don't you guys come down and hold the Passover with us? You're our brethren, right? You're supposed to be worshiping the Lord too. We're going to do this. Come on down. Because ever since Jeroboam, the son of Nebad, pretty much people from Israel hadn't been coming down to celebrate the Passover because they had their false gods set up. Even though they were supposed to be going to Jerusalem to hold the Passover and these feasts and everything else that's dictated in the law of Moses. But they weren't doing this. So Hezekiah has a good heart. He's trying to bring the people back together, bring all the people back to God. Hey, let's open up the doors of the temple. Let's get things going again. Let's be offering the sacrifices and we're going to do the Passover. Now, if you remember, the, the, the Passover is supposed to be on the 14th day of the first month at even, followed by the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th day. So what happens in this Passover, and I, and I don't think I have it in my notes to read it, but basically because he's still like repairing the house of the Lord and getting the priests cleansed to even be able to, you know, sanctified to be able to do the work of the Lord because they needed to be sanctified. They needed to have sin offering. They needed to be put out from the temple from doing their service until they were clean and holy to be able to serve God again because none of this has been done. So he's getting the Levites back in line and back in order to do the service and the priests. And what happens is he holds his Passover and he asks God, God, you know, please forgive the iniquity because they weren't supposed to hold the Passover unless they were clean. You're supposed to be clean, you know, not from touching dead bodies, all this other stuff, but nobody was clean. No one was saying anybody saying, we're just now trying to get right with you, God. It wasn't even the right day. It was like a month later. And he says, God, just forgive us. We're trying to do what's right. Please accept this Passover. And God listened to Hezekiah and he accepted it. You know, even though it was different from what they were supposed to be doing every year, special circumstance, everything going on, he allowed Hezekiah to do that without, without problem. So it's really cool. Look at verse number five of chapter 30 here in Second Chronicles. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. And that's the important thing, as it was written, right? They were doing it in some sort, right, with their false idols and everything else, but not the way that it was written, not the right way, not the way that God commanded it to be done. They weren't doing it. Now, pay attention to this because we already saw the attitude that Israel had, right? Even when they're being judged, they still want to have nothing to do with the Lord. You would think at this point, because this has happened years after they've been taken captive, so this is the remnant of Israel, the people who are still left in the land that weren't taken captive. He's sending out to these people saying, hey, come, let's have the Passover. They should have been humbled by this point. It's been years of them being in captivity and being ruled over by Assyria. You would think they'd be like, you know what? Yeah, we need to get right with God. Well, let's see what happens. Look at verse number six. So the posts went out. That's the, the messengers, right? Went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, ye children of Israel, turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as ye see. Again, looking at, looking at the, the verbiage and what's being said there about the reprobation of, of Israel, right? They rejected God, God rejected them. He's saying, you know what? Don't be stiff-necked like them. Verse eight, now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into the sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever and serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if ye turn again unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive. He's saying, if you just can turn back to God, things will get better for you. God will have mercy on you. He just wants you to, in your hearts to come back to him so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. So the posts passed from city to city throughout, through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. Look at this. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked. This is why they were taken captive. This is why the judgment of God was upon them and he just totally rejected them. Because even to this point, they still don't care. They think it's a big joke and they're mocking. Oh yeah, you're going to hold a Passover. Oh yeah, that'll be great. Hearts completely of stone. 
don't care at all about the Lord. Now, it, that was, by and large, the reaction he got, but it does say in verse 11, nevertheless, diverse, so some of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Some of the people did come. It wasn't 100%, but the overall reaction was mocking, ridiculing, have nothing to do with it. Definitely not enough of them for God to have had the mercy for them to return, because that's not what happened. That never happened because of their stinking attitude of being stiff-necked and refusing, res refusing the Lord. Uh, jump down to verse number 14 there. It says, And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem, and all the altars for incense took they away and cast them into the brook Kidron. So this was all the, the altars of the false gods, right? The stuff that had been set up in the place of the house of the Lord. And, and they, they smashed them, broke them up, and cast them in the, the brook Kidron. And then in chapter 31, look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when all this was finished, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin. And Ephraim also and Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed, utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned every man to his possession into their own cities. This is after they hold the Passover and stuff. So there's a lot of good that came out of Hezekiah holding that Passover. I mean, they really just kind of cleaned house and a lot of good things happened. So we see all of this had happened which is why, go back if you would to 2 Kings 18, but keep, uh, uh, yeah, we're not, okay, yeah, you don't have to keep a place there. That's all we're going to read from 2 Chronicles. Uh, go back to 2 Kings 18. But this is why Rabshakeh is saying, like, why are you going to trust in the Lord? You're the one that's breaking down all these altars and images and stuff like that. Like, he's thinking that God's not going to be happy with them after doing all those things, which, in fact, God is really happy about that because he got rid of so much wickedness and idolatry and, and, and really was cleaning things up and getting people back into the will of the Lord. Verse number 23 in, in chapter 18. Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders. So, so he's just mocking him, right? He's saying, give pledges to my Lord, the king. Like basically, hey, we'll loan you 2,000 horses for the battle, all right? If, if you could even find anybody to sit on these horses and then go out to fight, we'll give you 2,000 horses. This, this is the way he's treating them. I mean, he's just totally mocking them. Verse 24, How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horses? He still is thinking that there's no way that they could even do anything without trusting in Egypt. That's why he keeps on bringing up Egypt. Because he's, he's thinking their, horse, their forces are so small. Like, there's no way. You have no chance of defeating us. Don't trust in Egypt. This is, what, this is what he's saying to him, and he's saying that, you know, you can't even, he said, you wouldn't even be able to defeat the small, because Assyria is this kingdom that's growing in power, right? So as they take over more countries and more areas, those kings become subservient to Assyria. So then they'll, they're called on to fight in these battles. So there's various armies and stuff that are, that are now part of the Assyrian army, Assyrian kingdom. He's saying, like, the least of those, you guys can't even beat like our, our worst company of soldiers. Verse number 25. And I, and I now come up, excuse me, am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go against this land and destroy it. Obviously, he's lying. So now he's just, every tactic he could think of to scare them, to, to belittle them, and to cause them to doubt and not to trust in everything, just to get them to give up is what's being done here. This, this Sennacherib is a good illustration or image of Satan, the adversary, of doing everything he possibly can to get the righteous to be scared, to tremble, to question, to doubt, to not trust in the Lord. And look, you'll notice over and over again how many times he says, don't trust in the Lord. Well, you think you're going to trust in God? Oh, God's not going to deliver you. And we're going to keep reading here. We'll see some more of that. Um, and he's saying, you know, the Lord's the one that told me to come up against you and to destroy it. Verse 26, Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. See, they're worried about the people being discouraged, right? Because he's saying all this stuff that's very discouraging. So they're trying to mitigate this and say, well, hey, look, we can speak your language. 
So just, just talk to us in your tongue. You know, you don't have to talk to us in Hebrew tongue. Like, just, we, we understand you. Could, well, let's talk, uh, you know, the Assyrian language. And, um, but then he says in verse 27, But Rabshak, he said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Now, the reason why he said this is because that's ultimately what would happen if they came and besieged Jerusalem. So if they set up a siege around the city, all the resources are cut off. So what they're going to be reduced to is drinking their own piss and eating their own dung because they're not going to have anything else to eat. It's going to cause a famine in the land. Now, I also just want to briefly make this point is that, you know, every word of the Lord is pure. God's word is pure. We have no problem with children being in the service and hearing these words because these are not bad words. These are not curse words. These are not swear words. There's nothing wrong with any word in the Bible being spoken in the presence of a child because every word of the Lord is pure. Amen. So if you have some problem with piss or with dung, then that's your problem. And don't judge God's word as being unholy or as being bad or something that's, you know, I've had people out sowing like, like gasp when I said the word hell in front of their child. Hell is not a, 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 um, a word that shouldn't be used in certain company. Hell is a word that is appropriate for all people. Now, it is a bad word because it's a bad place, right? So I don't want to you know, I'm trying to be careful, choose my words carefully. It is a curse word because hell is a curse. Right? But it's not something that we should avoid saying in regular language because it's a real place. It's really important and people need to be warned about hell. And it's not a, a swear word as, as our culture would call swear words, right? So any word in the Bible is legitimate. It's good. It's pure. And if you think that you're too holy for God's word, then, then you need to analyze yourself and, and maybe consider, again, judging God's word. Um, as you being better than God's word somehow. Look at verse number 28. Let's keep reading here. Then Rabshake stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language. So now he's just completely, you know, they asked him, hey, can you just speak Syrian with us? So now he just goes above and beyond just yelling out in Hebrew, right? So that everybody can hear what he has to say. Because why? Because he wants to scare everyone. He has no respect for them. And they're just coming in trying to, to, to bully him and get them um, scared and everything else. So he says, uh, they spake in a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria, making that king sound really, you know, the great king, the king of Assyria. He's so mighty and you're so weak. And just, just really hammering at their psyche, at their, at their minds, trying to get them scared. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. Is there anything more satanic than that? Let not Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. Don't, don't put your trust in God, saying the Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered in the, into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. He's trying to make captivity sound not so bad, right? So don't trust in God. Don't trust in your king. Don't trust in, don't trust in anything else. We're going to get you anyways. Hey, just give up. It's not going to be that bad. They're still going to take him captive. He's like, you know what? You're, you'll be able to drink out your own cistern until, verse 32, you know, he tells them all these good things. Oh, you'll eat of your own vine. You'll eat of your own fig tree. You'll have your own water. Well, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and not die. Oh, yeah, except you'll be in bondage. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, the Lord will deliver us. Talk about a minister of Satan. And we need to be aware of the scary people that seem to have a lot of power and maybe have defeated so many other people because that's what happened here. This is a scary force, someone who's, who's conquered a lot of lands, seems to have a lot of power, right? In the eyes, in fleshly eyes, you're looking at someone, they have, they have a lot of power or prestige. 
They use scare tactics and they'll try to say whatever they can to scare you and to shake your faith. And we need to be aware of people like this. It may not be a king. It may not be the king of Assyria, but there are other wicked people and there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's who our spiritual warfare is against. And you need to be aware of this and don't let them wear you down and beat you down and get you to the point where you're questioning God. You need to stand firm. Don't be scared by these people, no matter how much perceived power you think they have, because you know what? There's no power except to come from God. The, the, the most powerful people in this world, God can extinguish them in a heartbeat. He, could, he lifts up and he takes down. So we don't have, that's why we don't have to worry if the most powerful people come up against you and try to get you to, to, to denounce your faith or shake your faith or not to trust in the Lord or whatever the case may be. Because if you're doing what's right, God's with you. And that's the bottom line. Let's finish up the chapter here. Look at verse 33. Have any of the... And see now he's... It shows you he's just, he's just comparing the Lord to all these other false gods. And he has no respect in the Lord. Look at verse 33. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, and Hena, and Iba? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand. Well, it's because you don't know the Lord. Because the Lord's actually real and all the other gods were fake. But he doesn't care. He's blind. He doesn't know that. Verse 36. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. Now, this goes to show what a great leader Hezekiah was. And it shows you the restraint that they had in order to heed the commandment of Hezekiah. Because think about that. I don't know about you, but I'd be getting burned up hearing this guy, you know, talk bad about the Lord. Say, oh, don't trust in the Lord. I'd want to be shouting out from the wall saying, oh yeah, take it, you know, shove it, Sennacherib, because you can't do anything, you know, and just kind of mouth it off to him. That, that would be the attitude I'd want to have. Having faith in God, right? But they didn't do that. No one said anything. They just let him go. Why? Because the king commanded. And they were following the rule of the king. And, and that shows you the respect that he had for no one to, to even to do that. And you know why he had that respect? Because he had a true faith in the Lord. Because he got things right. He got rid of all the high places. He was acting on principle and on integrity according to the word of the Lord. And when you do that, you will be respected. Bottom line. Even the world will respect people. If you, have, if you can maintain integrity in your belief, you will have respect. And especially among, among God's people. When you have a good testimony and you're walking according to the will of the Lord, you'll be, and, you know, it's not about lifting yourself up, but if you want to do a great work and lead people and be a good leader, you're going to need to have people respect you. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is if you're not a hypocrite. Hezekiah was acting in, in a way that was non-hypocritical because he fully wanted to follow the Lord and the commandments, keeping the sacrifice and doing all the stuff that they were supposed to be doing. And as a result, people followed his lead. Follow. I mean, that's that's what got me really excited about going to Faithful Word when I when I've been out of church for years and years and years and had been saved for a while, but but just never really got in a good church. There was a good leader there, someone who actually lived the way that he believed, and that's the example I'm trying to be with this church, and that's the example that you need to be if you're going to have in the you know the best and most influence on other people's lives, even if you're not a pastor. Just being able to have a good testimony to influence other people that know you. People influence other people that see you, saying, wow, well, there is something a little bit different because this person actually does take the Bible seriously. They don't just go to church and then it's everything else goes the rest of the time at home. No, there's a, if there's a standard, if the Bible says something, that's what we're going to do. And that's the way we're going to live by. And that's how you're going to have the most respect and influence on people. And that's going to also go into helping to, to, to bring people to understand at least the truth because if you're doing what's right, they can at least see, okay, well, he's not being hypocritical like all these other people are. It turns people off. It turns me off. It turned me off for a long time of even attending church just because of hypocrisy. Last verse, verse 37. 
Then came Eliakim, the son of Elkiah, which was over the household of Shepherd the scribe. And Joah, the son of Asaph, to record Hezekiah with a clothes rent and told him the words of Rapshaki. Next week we'll see how he goes to God and, and trust in the Lord and everything. And, and um, so a couple, we have a couple more chapters of Hezekiah before we get on to his wicked son of uh, Manasseh. And then Ammon and Josiah. And Josiah is really going to be exciting again. But um, let's borrow his word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. Thank you for these great stories and these great uh, heroes of the faith, Lord, like Hezekiah. I pray that you would please help us to, to dedicate our hearts and our minds and our souls to serving you, to wanting to do what's right according to your word, and to having a, this spirit that, that it might possibly be said of us to some level or degree that you know, before us there was not the like, neither shall there be after us. The way it was spoken of Hezekiah and the way it's spoken of, of some other great men in the Bible, Lord. Help us to have that type of fervency and spirit and desire to serve you, dear Lord. That you can do great things by using us because we're offering ourselves up as a living sacrifice, God. We ask for your blessing upon our church and just help us to do your work and to reach as many people as possible with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.